John chapter 5, verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son of Man quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of God. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. In John chapter 5, the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders of the day, they're upset with Jesus. They're upset with Jesus because he's committed a number of infractions according to their opinions. He healed a man on the Sabbath. Last week we studied about the paralyzed man by the pool of Bethesda and that this man was just inches away from being able to get into the healing waters, but he couldn't get himself into the healing waters. And so Jesus walked by, talked to him, and healed him and told him to take up his bed, arise, and walk. And the man took up his bed, which was just a little cot-like deal. We're not talking about a four-post king size or anything, but a little, a little cot, maybe a sleeping blanket or a sleeping bag type deal, picked it up, carried it off. And the, uh, the, the religious leaders saw him doing that, and they said, you can't carry your bed on the Sabbath. This is the Sabbath day. Can't do any work on the Sabbath. And this man said, well, the man who healed me told me to pick up my bed and walk. And they said, well, who was he? He I don't know. And so later Jesus found him in the temple, and the man knew that it was Jesus and told the religious leaders that Jesus healed him. And so the religious leaders were mad at Jesus because he broke the Sabbath by healing on the Sabbath, and he broke the Sabbath by telling this man to take up his bed and walk. Now, we studied last week how they were wrong about that. But Jesus' reply to them was, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. And this made them more angry and Matthew 5.18 says, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. When Jesus said, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work, he was claiming God is his Father. When he claimed God is his Father, he was claiming God's authority. He, his authority came from God, and so he spoke on behalf of God. And they believed in John 5.18 that that made him equal with God. And so they're upset with him, and they're angry with him. And Jesus responds to their anger by giving this huge dissertation about who he is, and his, his ex explanation of who he is will last the rest of chapter 5. We have to break it up into two different studies. Jesus responded in John chapter 5 by giving them a thorough explanation of who he is. He is the Son of God. And not only did he claim that he's the Son of God, but he actually proves it in this passage that he's the Son of God. He's also the Savior, and he's also the righteous judge. So let's look at the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. If you look in verse 19, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. And so that's his first response, is that what you see the Son do, he learned that from the Father. You see, back in Bible times, a father had a vocation, he had a skill, he had a craft, a trade, and he taught that to his son. And so if you had a man who was a carpenter, he would teach his son to be a carpenter. If you had a man who was a fisherman, he would teach his son to be a fisherman. Now, they didn't have radio DJs back then, but, you know, if that were the case, he would have taught his son to be a radio DJ. I mean, the father passed his vocation, his skill down to his son and taught him how to carry on the family business. Now, Jesus, his father is God, but on this earth, Joseph raised him, and so Joseph 
was a carpenter and taught Jesus to be a carpenter. And that's what Jesus did in his adult life before he revealed himself as being the Son of God and as being the Messiah. He was a carpenter. And hence, you've got the bumper stickers. My boss is a Jewish carpenter. That's what that's referring to. Fathers taught their sons their vocations, their trades, their skills, their crafts. If you had a man who was a farmer, he taught his son how to farm. You know, I think we'd have a better society today if we continue to do that. Not saying that, not saying that a son should carry on the work that his father did. I would like to see my boys do something greater than radio. But it would be great if fathers actually invested that time in their sons and their children, their daughters too, to teach them how to go through life and how to, so how to take care of themselves and how to take care of a family and how to have a family. I think that would be something our society would benefit from. But you could tell what a man's father did by what that man did in, in his, in that, back in those times. If you saw a man who was a fisherman, his father was likely a fisherman. If you saw a man who was a carpenter, his father was likely a carpenter. And if it was a small enough town and you saw a man who was a carpenter, you knew there was only one carpenter back in the day. You could probably tell who that man's father was. And so on and so forth. Jesus says, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. He's saying that he is the Son of God, and you can tell that he's the Son of God by looking at what he does. God gave Jesus power, direction, and authority to work on this earth, to work on his behalf on this earth. And you could look at what Jesus did. You could look at his actions. You could look at how he handled himself. You could look at his miracles, and you could hear his word, the teachings that he taught, and you could tell by those things that he came from God. And Nicodemus, he recognized this, and a number of people who were in the leadership in the, in the Jewish nation at that time, they recognized this. Back in John chapter 3, verse 2, Nicodemus says, We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Nicodemus went to Jesus under the cover of darkness, went to him by night to talk to him. He says, We know you come from God because nobody could do these things except God be with him. So Nicodemus he saw Jesus, and he knew that Jesus came from God. He knew that Jesus was of God. And there were a number of people in that day and time that they saw Jesus, and they saw what he did, and they heard what he taught, and he taught with, as one with authority. He had the authority to teach. He, he spoke with authority. He knew what the Scriptures was all about because in, in a roundabout way, you could say he wrote the Scriptures, okay? And so he, he taught with authority. He came from God, and people recognized that. And Jesus is pointing this out in this passage. He says, you can look at me and look at what I do and tell that I come from God because the Son does what the Father does. The Father teaches the Son what to do, and the Son does that. Verse 20, for as the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that himself doeth, he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Jesus here was going on to say that the works he did were from God. And by the time we get to John chapter 5, Jesus had done some marvelous works. He had turned the water into wine. Now that wasn't a public miracle, but there were those who knew about it. He had healed the nobleman's son. He had done he had healed this paralyzed man in John chapter 5. He had done some marvelous works by the time we get to John chapter 5. But Jesus says, He will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. The bigger works were still to come. The bigger miracles were still to come. Greater things were right around the corner. These people would see greater things and that they would marvel at them. And that was true in the scriptures. You read, you continue to read in the book of John, you're going to see some greater miracles take place in the book of John. You're going to see Jesus feed 5,000 people with very little food. You're going to see Jesus bring a man back from the dead before we are through studying the book of John. But we still haven't seen the greatest miracles that Jesus performed. We have not seen the greatest works that he has performed, that he will perform, because one day he is coming back to this earth, Amen. and he will establish his kingdom on this earth, and the things that go on in those days are going to dwarf anything that we have read about happening in the four Gospels or in the Old Testament, any of the miracles that we've read about in the scriptures that have already taken place, what happens in the days when Jesus establishes his kingdom on earth, and when God eventually creates a new heaven and a new earth, what happens then is going to dwarf, it's going to render insignificant the miracles that we have already seen him work. The best is yet to come. The Bible teaches that Jesus 
is the Son of God. He's the only begotten Son of God. Amen. It states it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It also proves that Jesus is the Son of God by recording the miracles. Now, we talked about how you can look at the miracles that Jesus did and know that he comes from God. Nicodemus stated it back in John chapter 3. Jesus states it here in John chapter 5. And the book of John is basically the recording of seven, seven different miracles. There were many miracles that Jesus did. John picked seven of them out and put them in this book so that we could read them, read about them, and that we would believe in Jesus. That's what you will read at the end of John chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31. Basically, John says, these things were written so that you will believe. Mm -hmm. So the Bible states that Jesus is the Son of God. It proves it by recording his miracles. The question is, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, the only Son that he created in a woman's womb without the presence of an earthly father, the only son that he set aside that is 100% God, 100% man, the only son set aside to be a sacrifice for the sins of the people. He's the only begotten son of God. Do you believe that? And do you trust in that? Have you placed your faith in that? Jesus is the son of God. Not only is he the son of God, but he's the savior. Verses 23 and 24 teaches us that Jesus brought salvation into the world. Verse 23 says that those who are saved will honor God by honoring Jesus. And verse 24 teaches us that salvation comes by hearing and believing. Verse 24 also teaches us that salvation is eternal. It's something you can't lose. You look in verse 23, the Bible says that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. You cannot honor a person if you dishonor their children. I worked for a family-owned operation back in East Texas, and they had children. And we were respectful to their children. We, we, some of the um, members of the staff were, in a, in a pure way, they were affectionate toward the children. The, 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 chil the boss's children were their children, you know. They, they had seen them grow up. And I didn't have the privilege of watching these children grow up. I joined the company a lot later than that. But they honored the children, and in honoring the children, they honored the bosses. And if anybody was rude to the child, the bosses took it as if they were rude to them. You cannot honor me if you dishonor my children. Now, there were some in my past who thought that they could dishonor my children while proclaiming that they respected me, but if they had respected me, they wouldn't have treated my children the way they treated my children. You cannot honor somebody if you're dishonoring their children. Likewise, you cannot honor God if you dishonor Christ. You cannot honor God if you disregard Christ. You cannot honor God if you set Christ to the side and say it's really about faith in God and Jesus is just a tangent to that. You honor God by honoring Jesus. You honor Jesus, God takes it as if you're honoring him. Salvation comes in trusting Jesus, placing your faith in him and honoring him. Acts 4.12 says, there is salvation, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Mm -hmm. How are we saved? We are saved in Christ's name. Yes. We are saved by faith in Christ and nothing else and no one else. Saved by God's grace through our faith in Christ. Luke 24, 46 through 47 say, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. If we preach repentance of sin, but we fail to preach faith in Christ, we have preached an, incorrect, an incomplete gospel. If we preach repentance of sin and faith in God, we have preached an incomplete gospel. Salvation comes by repentance of sin and faith in Christ. Remission of sins, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in 
his name. And then in verse 24, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. Who sent Jesus? God sent Jesus. Leland, I thought you just said we had to place our faith in Christ. You place your faith in God by placing your faith in Christ. If you have placed your faith in Christ, you have placed your faith in God. You honor God by honoring the Son. But Jesus said, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. You hear the word. And when Jesus said, he that heareth my word, he doesn't, he's not saying he that hears the sounds of my words. He's not saying he that hears words coming out of my mouth. He's saying he that is listening to my word, that is hearing my word, that is receiving my word, taking my word in, analyzing it, and accepting it, believing it. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. You hear the word, you receive the word, then you believe on the Lord, and then you have everlasting life. Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Why aren't more people being saved? Because more people aren't hearing the word. If more people heard the word, more people would be saved. That doesn't mean everybody that's going to hear the gospel preached that's going to accept the Lord, but by percentages, the more people hear the gospel preached, the more people will accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That's why we have a Sunday morning radio show. And that's why we did the sunrise services last Easter. That's why we do the outreach that we do at the Brownwood Reunion. That's why we go out in public and we do things from time to time, and things I'd like to see us do more of. That's why we do those things, so more people will hear the word preached. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. When you place your faith in the Lord, you are saved at that moment. When you hear the word and you believe, you have everlasting life at that moment. That is the point of salvation. Salvation comes at the point of faith. And so Jesus says, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And look at this, and shall not come into condemnation. That's a promise. If you are saved, if you have repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you shall not come into condemnation. It doesn't say you should not come. It says you shall not come. The word shall means take it to the bank. This is the way it is. This is the way it's going to be. When God says thou shall, thou shalt, I shalt, he shalt, when, when God uses that word, and that's, why, that's why, one of the reasons why the King James Version is such a good version, because it separates the wills from the shalls. The shall is a, strong, is a stronger word. Okay, When he says, thou shalt, God is making a promise there. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. That's a promise. You will not, you shall not, under no circumstances will you come into condemnation. If you have repented of your sins and trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have everlasting life, you have salvation, and under no circumstances will you come into condemnation. You know what that means? It means you cannot lose your salvation once you have trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There are those who say you trust Jesus as your personal Savior, but if you backslide, if you turn back away, if you do this, you do that, you lose your salvation. The problem is if that's the case, and salvation is really by works instead of faith. Because if you can lose your salvation, how do you lose your salvation? You don't keep it up, right? You, you backslide. You, 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 you know, let me tell you how I gain weight. I go on, the, I go on these deals where I'm not going to eat any fried foods, and I'm not going to drink any sodas, and I'm going to walk a mile a day. You know how I wind up gaining weight after I do that? I quit doing that. I start eating the fried food, I start drinking the sodas, and I quit walking the mile a day, okay? When that, happens, when that happens, the scale starts putting some extra numbers on there, and I don't appreciate that too much. I have to keep up a certain level of works to keep my weight down, and we won't discuss my performance evaluation on that at this particular time, and I won't discuss, never mind, we, we'll move on. But what I'm saying is, if, sal if you could lose your salvation, it would be the same thing. You lost your salvation. Why? Because you quit going to church, because you quit praying, because you quit reading your Bible, because you started watching this pr particular type of TV show or whatsoever. You lost your salvation. That's a works for salvation system. 
Anybody who teaches that you can lose your salvation, their teaching works for salvation. The Bible teaches the opposite. The Bible teaches salvation comes by grace through faith. It comes at repentance and faith. You turn from your sin. You trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. When you do that, you are saved. And the Bible says you shall not come into condemnation. But is passed from death unto life. Verse 24. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. You are moved from the group that is considered dead people walking, and you are moved to, to the group that is people who have eternal life, who will spend an eternity in hell. Excuse me, an eternity in heaven. <laughs> that, that would be depressing. <laughs> During Christmas time, you know, the kids... Talk about Santa Claus, right? And, you know, Santa Claus has got two lists, right? He's got the naughty list, and he's got the nice list. If you're on the naughty list, you get a lump of coal, which back in 16th century England kind of had some value to it because that's where your heat came from. But nowadays we have electricity, so that's no longer helping us. If you're on the naughty list, you got coal in your stocking. If you were on the nice list, you got toys or candy canes or sugar plums or something. I don't know. We don't play Santa Claus at my house. But anyway, the trick for the kids is how do they keep their name off the naughty list and on the nice list? Or if they're on the naughty list, how do they get transferred over to the, to the nice list? You know, there are a lot of kids. I remember when I was a kid, I didn't start thinking about that naughty or nice list until we got to December. And then I'm going back over what all I did that year, and okay, how am I going to get on that nice list? I just so you all know, I don't believe in Santa Claus, and I'm not preaching Santa Claus. But... When you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are moved from the list of God's condemned to the list of those who will be accepted into heaven for eternity. You are moved from the naughty list onto the nice list. And that's a move that can't be undone. You are written at that point in the book of life. Yep. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. How are you passed from death unto life? By faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus is our Savior. He's the Savior. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the Son of God, and he's also the righteous judge. Verse 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. One day, we are going to stand before the Lord in the day of judgment. Yes. We might even look him in the eye. And the question is going to be at that point, did we accept him as our Savior? Did we reject him? If you are going through life and you are rejecting Christ, you are, you know, this Jesus thing and this religious thing, I've got to get this straightened out at some point in my life. I'm just not going to do it today. You die without getting that straightened out, you are going to face him in judgment. Mm -hmm. And he's going to say, you had opportunity. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that those who are condemned are condemned without excuse. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their own imaginations. Jesus is our judge. One day we will stand before him. One day we will answer to him. Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, the only begotten Son of God, the one who died for us on the cross, we will face him in the judgment. And Jesus said, that day is coming. Yeah. Verse 25, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is. The hour is coming. It's coming, it's approaching. And now is, it's approaching and it's approaching quickly. It, take it to the bank. This is something that is going to happen. The hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that are here shall live. They will be resurrected. The, everyone is going to be resurrected. Everyone is going to be brought out of the graves. The Bible says the sea will give up its dead. And they will all, we'll all stand before the Lord in judgment. Okay, that day is coming. We're not all going to the same place. But we're all going to stand before the Lord in the judgment. And then verse 29, Jesus says, And shall come forth, and they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. We will all be resurrected. We will all face the Lord in the judgment. The question is, what kind of resurrection will that be? 
And where will we spend that eternity? Will it be the resurrection of life? Will we be resurrected as children of God, as the adopted sons and daughters of God, standing before him in the judgment and being accepted into heaven because we repented of our sins and trusted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior because he died on the cross for our sins? Will we be received in God's kingdom? Or will we be sent to eternal damnation, to hell, to a place where all we experience is God's wrath because we did not accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. See, I'm going to confess something to you. I preach a lot about the kingdom. I don't preach about the kingdom, but I preach a lot about the fact that we're going to the kingdom. I don't know enough about the kingdom to preach about the kingdom. I just know it's going to be great, and that's where I want to go. That's all I need to know. You know, Miss Nancy was teaching the kids about heaven one day, and she, she was teaching them about how the lion will lay down next to the lamb. And... This kind of puzzled a couple of my kids because, you know, one of them wanted to know if there would still be bugs for the frogs to eat because if there's no bugs for the frogs to eat, what do the frogs eat? I mean, it's hard to imagine a frog eating an apple if you think about that. So that was kind of puzzling. And the other thing was, well, if the lion isn't eating meat, are we going to eat meat? Are we going to be eating all vegetables? And, you know, when you're eight years old, that doesn't necessarily sound like heaven. So, you know, there, I don't know, you know, uh, about bugs. Now, bugs, you know. There was, there was a lady who told me that a heaven with bugs didn't seem like heaven to her. So, you know, these, these, these are all silly things. These, these are all silly things. Let me tell you, when we go into that kingdom, we're going to be impressed. And whether there's steak on the table or whether we're eating steamed broccoli, we're go, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be delicious. It is going to be food like we have never eaten before. It is going to be just absolutely wonderful. And it's going to be a blessing. And I preach about that. One day the Lord is coming back and he will establish his kingdom. And those of us who know him as Savior, he will receive us into that kingdom. We will ever be with the Lord. It will be peaceful. We won't know what stress is anymore. We won't know what health problems are anymore. We won't know what family problems are anymore. We won't know what poverty is anymore. It will all be good. And I preach about that a lot. What I fail to teach uh, and preach about is God's judgment and what happens to those who do not accept him as their personal as, who do not accept Jesus as their personal savior you know that heaven thing sounds pretty good Leland but what if I don't want to go well your only other option is God's wrath his judgment his indignation his anger his punishment you see the Caribbean has a lot of pretty islands in it blue clear ocean white sandy beaches palm trees coconuts, beautiful weather all the year round. And if I wanted to bad enough, I could get together the money and I could go down there and live in the Caribbean, right? That wouldn't be smart because I'd be outside of God's will, but if I wasn't considering God's will, I could go live in the Caribbean. It'd take me a lot of money to do that. I'd have to figure out some way to do it, but it's possible. People do that sort of thing. But, you know, on the other hand, Brownwood, Texas is not all bad. Early Texas is not all bad. I, I kind of like it here. You know, we kids have good schools here, have good friends here, have a good job here, have a good church here. The, you know, the, the steak dinners here that, that you can you know, buy the pork chops from the meat market and cook those up. It's second to none. I don't think they have pork chops in the Caribbean. I'm not sure. So, you know, the Caribbean would be nice, but Brownwood, Texas, or just about any part of Texas is okay. The problem is when you're looking at eternity, you can't look at it that way. You can't look at it. The kingdom's nice, but this is okay. No, this is not okay. The kingdom is wonderful. Yes. Hell is horrible. And there's no in-between. Those are your options. Accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and enter into that kingdom or reject him and spend an eternity forever enduring and suffering God's punishment, his wrath, his indignation his anger. To me, that question is a no-brainer. Turn from your sins and trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. He's the Son of God. He's the Savior. He's the righteous judge. And if you turn from your I mean, you can trust you can trust the Lord in that day of judgment. You can trust him to judge righteously, to do with your eternal soul what is fair. And what is right, and what is right is if you have received him as Savior, you'll go into that kingdom and you can trust him for that. But if you have not accepted him as Savior, what's fair and right is that eternity in God's punishment, that eternity in hell. Don't, don't make the wrong decision. Turn from your sins and trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. 
Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repent. Turn. Turn from your sins. Trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. At that point of faith, you are saved. If you're saved and you have that faith, that's going to result in you following him. You, those disciples, they believed in Jesus and they followed him when he called them to follow. Same thing should happen in our lives. And the result of that should be that we repent and that we're baptized. We should follow the Lord. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And if you have, are you following him? Are you growing closer to him? Are you learning about him? Is your spiritual life getting stronger? Is your faith getting stronger? Are you growing as a person, as an individual? If you're not, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, let today be the day that you make that, that, you make that decision to turn from your sins and trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But if you have, but you haven't been following him, let today be the day that you purpose in your heart, that you make that decision, that commitment, that you will follow him from this day forward. Amen. Let's stay. We'll have a hymn of invitation.